A Roman emperor was a truly age-inclusive job. Through 1500 years of the office's existence, it's been held by both toddlers and very old men. In this video, we're going to figure out who were the oldest and the youngest emperors, and how old were the in-betweeners. We're also going to answer a bunch of related questions about their average length of reign, lifespan, and how those differed throughout the centuries. So please enjoy. First of all, let's decide who counts and who doesn't. I have 169 entries on the list, which includes every emperor who had a sole rule over at least a part of the empire, or was a co-equal partner in ruling the whole empire. This covers pretty much everyone who has ever been a somewhat legitimate senior Augustus, and also includes a couple of successful usurpers, who had little or no recognition, but still ruled a part of the empire for a substantial period of time. This, however, excludes most of the child emperors, at least for the period during which they had a senior colleague. With this roster in mind, we are going to determine the overall record holders, and also give separate answers for the empire before the fall of the West and after. So first, let's give way to the elderly. Who was the oldest ever Roman emperor? This in itself can be three different questions. Who was the oldest to assume the office? Who was the oldest while holding the title? And who was the emperor who lived the longest? These three questions all have different answers. The overall winner of the eldest at the start of the reign is Gordian I, who was elevated at the age of either 79 or 80. His closest contender in the classical empire was Tacitus, who became emperor around the age of 75. And the third place would be shared between Pupienus and Galba, who were both pushing 70s. If we include Eastern Emperors in the ranking, then the second place also gets split. Nikephorus III was around 75 when he usurped the throne, so he would share the silver with Tacitus. You might think that assuming the office at 79 would ensure Gordian a victory in two other categories for the elderly, but you will be mistaken. Those of you who are familiar with the history of the 3rd century crisis know that Gordian is a contender for another, less impressive record. And because of this, he only gets the third place in the eldest at the end of the reign category. He gets the throne by Justinian, who died at 83, and Anastasius I, who had been emperor up until his death at the age of 87. Apart from that, Tiberius gets in between Gordian and Tacitus in this ranking for the unified empire because of his relatively long reign. Another new appearance on the list for the unified empire is Augustus, who reached the same age as Tacitus while being the emperor. Now you may think that this is it for the eldest emperors, but there is a curious case that needs to be mentioned. There were only three imperial abdications in Roman history up until the fall of the West, with the third one being Romulus Augustulus himself. But in the Eastern Roman Empire, forcing your predecessor into a monastery became more popular than outright execution as a method of disposing of possible competition. Most of the Tonsut emperors died shortly after forced abdication, but one in particular managed to survive for quite a while. John VI Cantacuzinos was forced to abdicate at the age of 62 and lived in a monastery for another 28 and a half years to the age of 91, which makes him the longest surviving person who has been a Roman emperor at some point in his life. His lifespan after abdication isn't actually the longest, but other lucky survivors were younger at the time of the end of their reign, so they didn't surpass him in total lifespan. Now let's go to the youngest. The sole uncontested rule of the unified empire had the highest minimal age. The youngest to ever get that job was Severus Alexander and Gordian III, both of whom were 13. If it doesn't have to be uncontested, then there are cases of Philip II and Diodomanian. Both were elevated to the rank of Augustus by their fathers at the age of 9. Philip's father was killed when the boy was 12, so some historians claim that the 12-year-old might have been an emperor during the autumn of 249, before his murderers finally got to him. Same logic can be applied to Diodomanian, who was executed a couple of weeks after his father. This would make him a 9-year-old senior Augustus for the period of two weeks. Another technical 12-year-old senior Augustus was Valentinian II, after the death of his brother Gratian. He only quote-unquote ruled a part of the Western Empire, but he deserves a mention since he had his own separate court since he was four years old. Later, the Western Empire got a 10-year-old uncontested senior Augustus Honorius, and after him, a 6-year-old Valentinian III. 
After the dissolution of the Western Empire, the minimal age deflation continued in the East. Constantine VII became emperor at eight years old, John IV at seven, Basil II was a six-year-old senior Basileus to his brother and imperial colleague, and almost three years old Constantine VIII. And even this isn't a record. The absolute champion is Michael III, who became the sole emperor at barely two years old. The youngest to abdicate were Romulus Augustulus, Heraclonus, and John IV. And barring technicalities like Diadumenian, the youngest to die were the emperors Gordian III, Elagabalus, and Alexius II. Having dealt with the ages, the next question I would like to cover is the longest and the shortest reign. On that front, we have different sets of contenders, depending on how we are going to count. Before any of the splits, the three longest serving emperors, who ruled over the whole empire all throughout their reign, were Tiberius with 22.5 years, Antoninus Pius with 22.6 years, and Augustus with almost 40 years. If we do not make continuous sole rule over the whole empire a requirement, then we'll have to add Constantius II with 24 total years as emperor, 11 of them as sole emperor, and Constantine I with 30 total years, 13 as a sole emperor. Adding Western emperors to consideration gives us two more important entries, Honorius with 28.5 years, and Valentinian III with 29.4. Yes, the part of the empire which only lasted 81 years, was ruled by Honorius and Valentinian III for 59 of them. Finally, when we add the part that wasn't ruled by two dimwits for six decades straight, our top gets completely wiped. All of the top three are now Eastern Roman emperors, Andronicus II with 45 years, John V with 46 years, and Basil II, 26 days short of half a century. Frankly, this last number didn't feel right to me, the fact that Basil was just shy of 50 years was kind of a shame. Of course we could add the reigns of Nikephoros Phokas and John Semiscus and get him to 62 and a half years, but that would clearly be cheating because we decided to only count senior emperors and Basil was clearly a junior colleague to both generals. But then I realized I didn't have to cheat. You see, Basil was crowned as a co-emperor by his father Romanus II in 960. At the time he was a junior colleague to his dad. But when his father died on 15th of March 963, this was no longer the case. But didn't Nikephoros Phokas become an emperor? Well, not until August 16th that year, which means that from 15th of March to the 16th of August, five-year-old Basil was a legitimate senior Basileus of the Romans. He was even confirmed as such by the Senate. So if we add these five months as a kind of boss baby to his almost 50 years as an actual emperor, we get his sole reign to a Roman record of 50 years, 4 months, and 4 days. Ok, so what about the shortest reigns? Going by the known numbers, the shortest recorded reign belonged to either the Gordians or Quintilus. Gordian I and Gordian II are recorded to only have reigned for 22 days. On the 22nd day of their joint reign, Gordian II was killed in battle, and upon hearing this news, Gordian I committed suicide. Since Gordian II obviously died before Gordian I, he would be the shortest reigning emperor. Quintilus may challenge this claim, since according to some sources, he only reigned for 17 days. Other sources, however, say that he reigned for around 70 days, so there is no clear answer to this question. Eastern emperors came nowhere near to challenge this record, except for one unconfirmed case. There is a story about the emperorship of Constantine Lascaris. On the day of the assault on Constantinople by the Crusaders, Alexius V fled the city, so the nobility tried to elect a new emperor. Constantine Lascaris won the vote and tried to rally the populace in the Varangian Guard to the defense. But at the end of the April 13th, seeing that the fight could not be prolonged, he fled with a band of refugees to his brother in Nicaea. It is unclear whether or not he accepted the imperial purple, and if he did, then when did he renounce his emperorship? So there may have been a scenario in which he began his reign at around 1 a.m. on the 13th of April and then ended it on the evening of the same day, making him the only ever one-day Roman Emperor. Now 
Now that we've covered all the extremes, let's talk about everyone in between. An average Roman emperor assumed the office at around 38 years old and ruled for almost 11 years to the age of 49. If he was lucky enough to be one in a four who survived their abdication, then he could hope to live for almost eight more years on average. The new emperors became five years younger on average after the fall of the West, but they were still reigning to about 49. What increased significantly in the Byzantine era is the lifespan after abdication. The emperors of antiquity could hope to survive only for a little over half a year, while a medieval emperor still had an average of 3.5 years to go. Most emperors assumed the office while being in their early 40s. For the Eastern Roman Empire, this changed a bit, with more of them ascending the throne in their 20s. Finally, if we plot the average length of reign in different centuries, we can clearly see how the crisis of the 3rd, 5th and 11th centuries affected this statistic. Komnenian restoration is also apparent, but the last few centuries present a misleading picture. Even though the average length of reign is very high, the empire was still in decline, so these numbers should not be taken at face value. I hope you enjoyed the video and didn't get too bored by the amount of numbers presented in it. If you have a Roman Emperor age-related question that I haven't answered yet, be sure to ask it in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching till the end, and I will see you in the next one.